This week's episode of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast is powered by Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy. CGA is the world's most comprehensive online gun dog training resource. They've got over 160 instructional videos that includes everything that you need to take a seven-week-old puppy to a finished gun dog. Visit cornerstonegundogacademy.com, sign up for their free preview module, and begin your training journey today. Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy, the most advanced gun dog training resource on the web. You are listening to the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, episode 153. This week on the show, we're talking the evolution of waterfowl gear as we compare how things were to how things are today. All right, welcome to this episode 153 of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Palm, and this week we are brought to you by Quack Rack. Quack Rack's the premium decoying gear hauling solutions for your UTV or boat. 100% American made, front racks, roof roof baskets, rear racks. You can check out uh, Garrett from Quack Rack. He was on with us episode 75. You can also follow Quack Rack on Facebook and Instagram or by checking them out on the hashtag haul more, shoot more. Or you can visit quackrack.com. Check out all their products today. Joining me this week as he always does, Dan Hrushka. Dan, what's up? Not too much, man. I think we need to get Garrett back on here. Episode 72, that seems like a long time ago. 75, but yeah. It was 75, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was. And it's, funny, it's funny, it doesn't seem like it was that long ago, but yeah. No, and that was a well, uh, well-received well episode with him on it. Yeah, for sure. Um, if you're new to the show, you can check out episode 75 and all of our past episodes on iTunes or Stitcher or Spotify. Anywhere you can find quality, quality podcast content, you can find our program. And you can also check us out hpoutdoors.com, across all social media platforms. You can find all of our stuff out there as well. So if you're new to the program, welcome. If you've been around for a while, thank you for being here and uh, joining us this week. Also brought this week, uh, supported by Gunner Kennels, engineered for your dog, designed for travel and built for your peace of mind. The G1 series has set a new industry standard and put Gunner in a category all its own. Gunner was started to protect your pet and it continues to be the center of everything that they do. And they're dedicated to building the best and safest uh, pet travel crate on the market because man's best friend deserves man's best kennel check out their g1 series of kennels and accessories at gunnerkennels.com also this week uh, supported by base map it's the most comprehensive mapping app helping hunters plan navigate and share their next outdoor adventure base map includes over 700 mapping layers to help hunters plan at home or navigate in the field property ownership information hunting unit boundaries it's your go-to mapping app for anyone looking to be more successful on their next hunt. No cell service, no problem. Down to download unlimited high resolution offline maps to use while you're in the field. It's free to download and available on iOS and Android covering all 50 states. So visit basemap.com, learn more today. Own the outdoors with Basemap. And also thank you to this week uh, for uh, thank you this week to 737. Duck and Goose Calls, their original design, select great components, superior sound, and unparalleled service. 737 takes exceptional pride in promote, producing the finest quality, best built premium calls in the market today. They're made here in America and only offered direct to consumers through their website. Shipping in the U.S. is always free, and international orders are also now accepted online. 20-day money-back guarantee and a lifetime warranty accompanies every call purchase. 737, lead the flock. And also, we've got a... New company that's supporting the show this week, Duck Camp, has joined the HP Outdoors community. Duck Camp makes high-quality hunting apparel in their own camouflage patterns and premium fabrics. These guys are shaking up the industry with their the more modern take on hunting apparel. Duck Camp makes super nice lightweight, midweight, and heavyweight hunting shirts that are perfect for the blind, uh, back at camp, or while out in town. Uh, we've had a chance to test out the new three-layer ultralight rain jacket. That thing is sweet. It breathes unlike most rain jackets out there. And it's also got a great uh, camouflage outer shell for a cold weather hunt. So it's a great outer uh, layering piece for late in the season. It's also nice lightweight. You can wear it on its own early in the year. Packs down into its own pocket. It's perfect for blind bags. Check out the new rain uh, jackets and all their other great duck camp apparel at duckcamp.com. All right, Dan. So this week we're talking about 
the evolution of waterfowl gear. And this kind of came up, I think, as we were talking about, um, I think it ultimately started with decoy realism is sort of how we got onto this topic and how so much about decoys today are marketed towards realism and, you know, almost inevitably when you see on social media, someone's talking about decoy realism, someone chimes in, you know, well, my grandfather didn't need, you know, he just needed like milk carton, milk jugs or cut tires in half in the field and killed birds over them. Right. So it got, it got, got us kind of thinking and talking like, where have we seen the most progress and most change in waterfowl gear and equipment uh, across sort of all of the tools that a waterfowler, you know, sort of takes to the field. Yeah. You know, and I think even the, the decoys go in waves, right? Cause you still see the black and white silos and, and uh, all the skinnies coming out where people used to, like you always say, you'd have to have Bigfoots, a whole trailer of Bigfoots go out there in the full bodies. And, and then you see the silos come out and that's all people are using now. So it, it's funny to see how things go and, even the silhouettes have more realism than what they ever did. So um, I think, like you said, that realism and then just seeing everyone buying so much equipment as the season's starting up, I think I think it's a good conversation to see where we where the sport has come from and, and where it's at now. Yeah, because we talk about a lot, you know, it's great having one or two companies or multiple companies that are really forward-leaning and innovative because it sort of, forces everybody to like up their game right and step it up and i think you've seen that across the uh the the spectrum and you know kind of talking to decoy specifically you know for a period of time there wasn't a lot of silhouette options on the market um you know and then uh, even that even at that time most of them uh you know were plagued with oh they shine or they you know, you can't push them into the frozen ground or whatever the, the case might be. They weighed 900 pounds. Right. I mean, it was always, it was <laughs> just, you know, things. And, and, you know, now you've got multiple companies producing high quality silhouettes. They're using different materials that are less reflective and all of these things. And they're lighter weight. They're more packable. And, you know, they're using stakes. that can be easily pushed into the ground or pulled out and all of these things. And I think that's kind of one of the other things that uh, innovation and sort of the evolution of waterfowl hunting has done is it's not only made better products, it's made it easier to use and more attainable by the everyday hunter or the common hunter. You know, I mean, uh, before when we're talking about the Bigfoot deal, right? I mean, if you were a hunter in a smaller truck or maybe you hunted out of an SUV or even a car, you're obviously not getting a lot of full bodies in there. So maybe you were looking at more like shells and that kind of thing where now you can get a, a really high quality spread of completely silhouettes if you wanted to. And, you know, I think a lot of people have done that and, you know, you can go out to the field with a lot of confidence knowing that your spread's going to be effective because of a lot of these emerging technologies. And, and had they been effective in the past? Absolutely. You know, I mean, guys have been killing birds for a long time over a lot of different ways, but I think, one of the things that allows people to be effective and, and sort of uh, flexible today is that, you know, every goose that flies over a field is not going to see the same Bigfoot decoy in every single field, you know? So that even that evolution allows you to be more effective. If everyone runs a full body spread and maybe you're the only one in the, in the area that's running a silhouette spread, maybe that's the different effectiveness that you'll need to, to be effective, you know, to be more successful, whatever the case might be. I like, um, I'd like to see the sales numbers for full bodies, like going over the last 20 years and just how the rise. And then it's, it seems like it's been falling. I don't know if that's correct or not, but do you ever see a, like a field full of silhouettes and people smashing birds and, just think that's the ticket. I, are you are you that confident in them yet? I uh, definitely. I, I've seen I've seen fields up on the eastern shore of Maryland where they've got exclusively silhouettes up there and killed killed birds no problem. Um, so I, I definitely wouldn't have a problem doing it. I I mean I've got full body decoys that I don't take out very often um, for a multitude of reasons, but yeah, I, I'm. I'm all about lightweight and the ease of application. And 
I think they're more than adequate to get the job done. So I don't have any concerns. I mean, where, where do you stand on that? I, I have full confidence in it. You know, some days I think especially adding uh, socks if it's windy and, and just adding a little bit of motion in it, you know, I'm a motion freak like that. But, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't hesitate to take them out. And I, I still think that there's a lot of people that need to mix in full bodies just to get that comfort. And I think that it almost plays along with the A-frames in the middle of a field. You know, there's just not the full confidence from – majority of hunters yet yeah i mean i think it's more likely that a lot of people have invested so fully into their full body spreads that they've got the trailers and they've got the quads and the things to get the stuff in and out of the field so like i don't think those hunters well even if they believe in you know the silhouettes could be effective i don't think that they have a high motivation to switch unless they're just tired of doing all that stuff but Mm -hmm. once you're invested you know what's you know at that point, it's no big deal. But if you're a new hunter and you're looking to build a spread and maybe you've got, you know, you live in a one garage, one car garage townhouse that you can't load up with a bunch of gear, you know, and don't have the storage space or whatever, you know, I think that's where you're probably going to see the more emerging silhouette type hunter who's limited on space, maybe limited on the ability to lug five dozen full bodies out into the middle of a spread and in the middle of a field. So being able to throw a couple packs of silhouettes on their back is appealing. Um, you know, obviously we're talking primarily field hunting here. So I, I think that it just depends on where you're at in your waterfowl career. But I definitely have heard of people who have sold their trailers and their full body spreads and all that stuff and just bought silhouettes and went with that and have been successful. So yep. I think there's probably people on <clears> – <throat> both sides of the fence on that, but I don't think that there's any question that there are more people open-minded to hunting silhouettes in greater numbers or exclusively than there has been in a period of time. Uh, And I I sort of look at it probably as like a, on a curve, you know, like back before full bodies was a thing, probably a lot of people, most people hunted with silhouettes or something similar. Full bodies became a thing and, you know, the pendulum swung the other way and now that was sort of the fad. I feel like the pendulum has swung back uh, to an extent to silhouette type uh, decoys. And I don't know where exactly on the curve that it is at this point, but I mean, you know, companies like dive bomb and tangle free and, you know, those guys that are doing silhouettes. I mean, they're, they're definitely selling a lot of decoys. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Lucky big owls. They get, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of options out there, but sure. when you, when you were thinking about, um, going through all this gear and thinking about old timers using stuff versus what we have now, does it make you feel kind of soft compared to old timers? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no. I'm just know. thinking like even, uh, even like going lightweight silhouettes, not lightweight because they weren't lightweight made of wood and like what they would do previously. Yeah. So I, I, it doesn't make me feel soft because I have no question in my mind that if there was an easier solution at that time, those hunters would have taken advantage of it too. I mean, like, there's no there's no point in doing extra work or making your life harder than it has to be just for the sake of making it harder than it has to be. You know what I mean? Like, that doesn't make you soft. That makes you smart, in my opinion. So, no, I, I mean, I think the, the way things were done in the past were done out of, out of necessity. Now mm-hmm. that necessity is not existent. So, you know, you have freedom of choice and some people may still do some of those things for the nostalgia of it and just, or that's what they know and they're the most comfortable or confident in. But like, I don't think that it's somebody's like, oh, I don't want to be looked at as soft. So I'm going to lug, you know, these decoys around. I think it's just different strokes for different folks, but I mean, no, it doesn't make me feel any less of a hunter if I'm hunting over lightweight silhouettes for sure. So let's compare and contrast to from the decoys. Let's just go with, uh, I don't know, floating floating decoys, floating mallards, floating uh, divers, whatever you want to do. I'm looking at my old canvas back wooden carved decoy right now. Mm-hmm. There's no feather detail. There's different paint colors and an eyeball. Yep. And a bunch of uh, 
BB holes in it. So what do you think out of necessity we needed all of the fine detailed decoys like we have now? Uh, I, I'm not sure that that was born out of necessity. I, I, um, I mean, does that appeal more to the hunter or the, that that's kind of how I lean towards it. Honestly. I mean, um, I think given the option, if you can get something that looks more realistic, I think it looks, I think it makes sense to do that. Is that, is it necessary? No, they killed birds long before over, you know, like a decoy you're describing, but could it help you incrementally? Sure. It might. And I think without a doubt, it's, it's, it's a thing where it's a, it's more visually appealing to the hunter. So you're more apt to spend money on that. Um, it's the same with camo. It's the same with everything in life that you make purchases with. If you like the way it looks, you're going to be more inclined to buy it. You know, Mm -hmm. you, you know, it's one thing if you, if you buy your vehicle solely based on reliability, that's one thing. But if you walk out in the driveway and you hate the way it looks every day, like, you know, you're not going to enjoy it as much. Right. So it's like, it's one of those things where there's a balance and, um, you know, as you, as you look around the market today, like there's still decoys out there that are more realistic than they were, than that would decoy that you're describing, but they're sort of budget friendly. Right. And they're sort of mm-hmm. like bottom, like kind of scoffed at a little bit. And maybe, maybe they sacrifice on durability and things like that. But I mean, they're absolutely good enough to buy, to kill birds. I mean, my first, my first decoys that I ever bought was like a, a really cheap set of the, the um the greenhead gear like hot by twos or whatever they were mallards and it was like the same pose six drakes six hens like you know nothing special about them and you pitch them out there and you can still kill birds over them i mean they were more lifelike than a wooden block but they're nowhere near as lifelike as a you know a new avian x or something with flocked heads and all that kind of stuff you know it's just so necessity i don't think so But, um, could it incrementally help you? Sure. I mean, who knows, but it doesn't hurt. I don't think, you know, I don't think it's good. It's, uh, uh, you know, hurting in any way. So again, it just boils down to what kind of hunt do you want to have? And some people, you know, love hunting over hand carved decoys that they've made all that kind of stuff. Like I love hunting over decoys that I can beat the crap out of and just, (laughs) you know, don't chip paint all over the place because I'm. I don't want to have to spend time dealing with it. Uh, you know, again, just different strokes for different folks, right? Yep. No, I agree. I agree. And, uh, you know, you always see that on social media. If a bird's close enough to see the detail in that decoy, then they're going to be dead, which is true or should be true. But yeah. at the same time, there's a lot of advances that I think are very well, and helpful. I, and I do have a question in my mind about about that. So, like, I I... I I fully have, I'm fully confident that decoys in a field or in a, in a, on water, or whatever, they are, they are an attractant to birds in the area that there's something there that they may want to come feed on or whatever. I do, however, wonder how much and for how long is the birds, are the birds focused on the decoy? And at what point do they shift their focus on like, where can I land? Like, where are the pockets, right? Like, where's the negative space in that group of decoys, right? Um, so they, they may, you know, they're looking at, they're looking at it. Okay. There's something going on there, but then at some point they have to, they have to change their process to think like, where am I going to land in there or where looks safe for me or where looks good. Right. So at some point I kind of feel like their, their attention is pulled off the decoys to some extent and worried about like where I'm going to go in that little area. That's a good thought process. Hence hence the whole landing pocket, right? I mean, that's why people talk about having space for the the birds to land. If they're going to focus on that and you don't have decoys in that hole, like why are you worried about, I mean, it's less, less concerning, right? Uh, And in theory, they're going to be closer to the decoys when they have that thought or they've, they've shifted to that focus. I have no idea if any of this is realistic or not. It's sort sort of my thought as to how a bird is evaluating a spread or, or whatever as they approach it. What if we came up with an equation to where like the first the first pass for ducks were seeing those ducks and getting close the second the, the second circle was 
evaluating for safety purposes, and then a third was finding a place to land. Can you imagine if that if it was that easy? Yeah, I mean, if it was that easy, but I mean, you know, like, <laughs> and that's the thing, like, you know, you have birds circle your spread time and time again, and I think that a lot of times people want to attribute that to their, well, they circled like four or five times, they didn't finish. It must be something they didn't like with the spread or something they didn't like with like the the decoys or something. And that may be true, but I think probably uh, a greater, a greater, um, more common, more common reason for them not to finish. If it's a spot that you scout and you know, they want to be or whatever is because they're probably seeing your concealment and your hide. You know, I think that's probably more why that's not work. Why didn't, didn't work out, but you know, it's, there's no way to know for sure. And, um, you know, there's always that the opportunity where, you know, okay, boom, these birds crest the horizon or they crest the tree line or whatever, and they're locked and they're coming in no matter what. I don't think personally in that situation, I don't think those birds are worried about what the decoys look like. <laughs> they want to be there. They're just looking for a spot to land. You know what I mean? They don't circle. They don't hesitate. They don't do nothing. They just bomb in. Right. Um, I think that's why you probably have success of killing stuff over tractor tires or whatever, because you scout it right. You know, they want to be there. And here they come. So I think it's, you know, it's just not that easy, right? <laughs> right. Especially first light. I mean, they're not, they can't tell the difference in paint or detail on a decoy. Like they're, they're coming in and coming in hot usually. Yeah. For sure. Right. I like that. I like that one. Yeah. So what are, what are some other areas where we've seen sort of a, a pretty drastic change in gear and sort of, um, you know, in the, in the waterfowl gear space and things that you've noticed that have kind of either improved. I want to say the big, just the big push lately, uh, let's go right into waders, right? And not saying that breathable waders are brand new because they're not, you know, they've been in, in production for a long time and, you know, the fly fishermen, I think that's pretty much what pushed me over the edge is when you see the fly fishermen and icy streams and just standing standing in it all day and getting out they're dry they're comfortable and and ready to go where when i used to wear a neoprene man you couldn't you not not to say you couldn't but it was just very uncomfortable to walk long distances either sweat and be uncomfortable and then you sit down and freeze and just the weight of them i think um the wader market coming into the hunting industry has been really heavy the last, what do you want to say, five, four or five years, maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, I think then versus now is, is huge. I think the, yeah, I mean, we've talked about this before, but when I first started sort of exploring breathable waders, it was kind of hard to find a lot of choices in camouflage that had like a boot attached. You know, they were more of a fly fishing type setup where now almost every manufacturer has at least one line of breathable wader in their portfolio, right? Whether Mm -hmm. it's, you know, you name the company, they probably offer you offer a breathable wader that is focused on the duck hunter. Now, um, that tells you a lot about what consumer feedback is giving them and what, the, where their sales are driving. Uh, I, I do think that, well, I, I don't know this to be certain, but my, my gut tells me that in general, breathable waders are more durable than neoprene. I don't know that to be fact, but I feel like they are in, in just my untrained personal opinion. Um, they're also, I think probably, more versatile uh, for the user, you know, that early season hunter to the end of the season hunter, you know, I can't tell you how many times in September I wore five millimeter neoprene waders, sweat my butt off hunting early season geese and stuff. Uh, those days are gone for me, which is kind of cool. You know, I'm a big fan of that. Right. <laughs> so I, I don't know if it was a, again, it's not a, I don't think this was a necessity because that certainly, certainly, you can get it done without them. And most of us did at some point in our lives for a period of time. But it's one of those things where it's absolutely added benefit to the hunt and allowed me to be more comfortable doing it. So, um, you know. This, I actually things. searched this before we got on. It said in uh, 
60s and early 70s, most people wore boot foot waders made of vulcanized rubber. Mm. And they said they were heavy, fit poorly, totally non-breathable, and had rubber sole boots with poor traction. Yeah. So, again, just upgrading, getting more comfortable. You can stay out in the field longer. That's what it's all about, right? Yeah, and I think, too, um, you know, a lot of things that I've seen have really... Because there was a period of time where I felt like it was hard to find a kind of affordably priced neoprene waiter. Felt like it was... I mean... I don't know, a qu- at least a quality waiter. And I think now with the the breathable game kind of going on, like there are more affordable options. There's certainly as much, you know, spend as much as you want on options, but there's definitely more affordable options as well. So it, it does sort of span the, the entire user base as far as that goes. And, um, you know, ultimately if it keeps you dry and comfortable, that's what it's all about. So finding what works for you is is the best way to go. But yep. I think um, L.O. Bean has been around for a while. I think they're, I don't know when their camo ones came out, but you know, the two ninety nine price point there is, is a great for a lot of people. Yeah. I, I, frankly, I, I, I would bet that $300 is probably on the high end for a lot of people on what yeah. it'd be my guess. Um, I know for me starting out hunting, I would have not, I didn't spend $300 on waiters. Didn't do it. I think my first way pair of waiters, uh, that I bought for hunting were, <laughs> three and a half mil um, neoprene Cabela's that were like 149. I think. Yeah. I, I was going to say my first pair were from Walmart. Mm-hmm. I think they were straight brown neoprene and same, same price point, 150. Yep. And really thin and just a pain in every single way you could think of it. It was tough to get them on. It was tough to walk with them. It was just not, not a good situation, but you know, going in, even let's talk, camo i think there's been camo and camo and clothing overall yeah i mean for this one for me this one um <coughs> excuse me you okay i got tickle my throat um i the the whole camo clothing thing for me i get less wor- i'm less worried about camouflage because i'm not laying out in the field in my camo i'm in a blind in my camo so like i don't really care you can wear blue jeans if you want like i don't you know, I'm, I, I, there's been a, there's been obviously a lot of research that goes into that and stuff, but for me, it's more about the garment quality and the materials and sort of the philosophy of, of how to, how to do it right. And, you know, whether you're a, whether you're a fan of Sitka gear or you're, you know, you wear Drake or you wear, you know, whatever your choice is, you know, whatever your preference is, um, I think everybody sort of come around on, maybe not so much outer layering stuff, but like a lot of the base layering things have come around. I mean, for a lot of people, myself included growing up, like a lot of my layering was a pair of cotton thermal underwear and a pair of jeans. Like that was part of my layering structure when I would like deer hunt, for example, it'd be cotton, cotton thermals, a pair of jeans, and then Carhartt bibs. It's probably what I wore most of the time when I was like deer hunting and stuff like that in the cold temperatures. I don't wear any of those things now <laughs> when I hunt. <laughs> Dude, I'm just thinking of like we used to set I remember my dad taking us deer hunting when we were little and the night before we would set out what we were hunting in and we would put our outer layer like lay it over the back of the couch and then what we'd have under that, put it on top. So we'd just come down, get dressed and walk out the door. And there's so many layers and so much cotton involved yep. in that. And especially like you know, you wear three pair of socks and the bottom two were cotton. And it's like, man, they would get soaked and it's no, <laughs> no wonder why yeah. you would just freeze. You walk to your stand, you could barely, you know, get up into your stand because you had to lift your knee up and it was so constricting. But then you'd cool down and, and just freeze. Yeah. Like that's all, <laughs> that's all I remember hunting with my dad at that age. Yeah. So I think there's been a lot of progress in, and, and it's not just in the waterfowl space, right? It's, it's it's in the athletic world, all that kind of stuff. Just wicking material, um, things that are built to make you more comfortable. And all of that has trickled down. I mean, whether you literally, one of you buy your camouflage from Sitka or if you buy your camouflage at your local Walmart, 
there are breathable base uh, base layers available of different flavors and price points, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, those are all those are all good things, and I think a lot of people have kind of come around on on some of those things. But, um, you know, sort of on this note, you know, with the camo thing, one one thing that I'm curious to know your opinion on is how about concealment and just blind options? You know, as far as that progress and i and i think back you know just in the last shoot you know seven or eight years just how it's changed and i'm curious your thoughts on just sort of like how that has evolved over time i think everything's mobile now right like we didn't have you had the layout blinds and that was almost it unless you went and actually built blinds you know a-frame blinds or something like that as far as we're around here, you know, there's always pit blinds and, you know, people digging out and, and doing all the major stuff. But the amount of portable A-frames and panel blinds on the market now is is incredible. And that's even the last three or four years. Yeah. Um, you know, we'd have the layout <laughs> layout blinds and that was the only option. And even if you're on a, on a fence row, and I think just the comfort, again, the comfort and just being able to sit there and BS with your buddies is, it's been a yeah. huge, huge Well, and I think you hit advantage. on it. I think you hit on it. You know, I don't know if the concealment and the blind evolution has been born out of necessity. I believe it's been born more out of comfort, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's about keeping you hidden, which you could always do via a variety of means, layout blinds, things like that. But that comfort piece is really what's changed the game. So not only can you now stay concealed, but you can also stay comfortable for a long period of time and not have to lay on the ground and all of these things that have offered or, you know, the situations where maybe the ground blind wasn't ideal, uh, where you would try to find like a, a more natural covered spot where you could be upright to see a little better or something like that. Now you can take that, that upright need and place it where you want it and conceal it. So again, Dude, do you I, know how many, how many <laughs> mesh camo nets I have right. that I haven't used in a long time? I'll, I'll take it and throw it over a uh, canoe or kayak or whatever I'm using. But we used to get on tree rows and nail it to one tree to another tree and hide behind that. Well, I can remember that infamous uh, freezing cold hunt that we went on where you had the crotch leak in your waders. Yeah, we had a mesh net up in front of us, and I remember specifically, it was not, I think it was you. We had two mallards fly directly over us, and you went to swing your gun up, and the barrel caught on. Oh, I just hit my mic stand. The barrel caught on that mesh net and prevented you from shooting up in the you know at these birds, um, which resulted in you know missed opportunity, and it's just like, you know, that really shouldn't be a thing. Like if you. But you don't need to do that anymore uh, to be effective. And, you know, I, I don't think I've hunted behind a mesh net in quite some time, but um, yeah, maybe that was I think I think my I think my gun was frozen open at that point anyways. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't have mattered. It was was not going to go was, off. It was stuck in a net. Yeah. Man, those were good times, though. Okay. But, yeah, just the – I mean, just think about how, you know, you had to hunker down behind that three-foot net instead of – sitting in a blind that actually cut some wind and mm-hmm. you could be comfortable in. Right. Absolutely. Or cook and breakfast or have a buddy heater to yeah. or keep you warm. Or, I mean, just think about what it's done for the ability to get kids in the field, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, uh, and elongate their period of time in, in the field and give them more opportunity to experience the outdoors. You can just, you can let them move around a little more. They can uh, have heaters going, cook them food, like, Whatever you know, they they've just got more flexibility to stay hidden and, and stay comfortable. And not just not just kids, but older guys too that say, "I'm not going and laying in a field and have to sit up." You know how long it takes me to sit up? Those birds will be gone. So for them to be able to sit on a a bucket or a chair and then just you know pop up real quick and much more likely to get them out in a field. Yeah, you know, shifting gears here a little bit as I'm thinking about this, I think probably one of the most interesting areas to look at evolution of uh in this discussion is ammunition and how you know for a period of time it was lead right so this truly was an evolution of necessity with steel and Mm -hmm. 
uh, the you know the Im- improvements over the steel that you you know saw over time, and then the evolution of the type of of shot. So you know with with the heavy shot and heavy you know things of that nature, and moving into the different types of material. And now you see Boss and uh, Heavy doing the bismuth, and you know everybody's doing bismuth, and just the the, the nuanced tweaks that you're seeing now. So I think. I think there, you know, it's an interesting case where you saw a change, a drastic change due to need, and then you've seen a more gradual progression due to, um, in part need, but also in part, um, uh, I guess it's not like uh, comfort, but it would be more of just like for, you know, for the, uh, the the desire for better performance, right? So like and ethics, right? I mean, but I mean, to to any, you know, like everybody here is everybody listening to this show is killed birds with, you know regular steel shot like we've all probably Mm -hmm. done that but and you could continue to do that but if you're looking for something more then you know you've you've got options now that you didn't used to have i tell you what i don't know if people realize how big of a change that was going from lead to steel and that i'm just talking like a mentality from old duck hunters that you know they grew up on it they hunted with that and then They started shooting steel and a majority of them quit. They quit hunting because they just hated shooting steel shot. Hmm. They said, you know, we'd unload our guns and birds would still be flying. And I, I assume like that first year that steel was required, it probably wasn't the best, right? It was probably just, uh, you know, pushed out and got out onto the market. So a lot of people were not happy Mm -hmm. at all, but just a side thought. Yeah, I mean, you got to figure too. Like at that time, you probably didn't have a great deal of choke varieties, and probably you know what we knew about the properties of steel and how it would perform were probably limited. And you know, it took some time for that to sort of develop and kind of kind of mature a little bit. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and I, I, I'm I'm sure that there was probably a section of the community that probably thought that it was a phase and that they would ultimately be going back to lead perhaps, you know, I mean, it's hard to say, but I think today you look at where, where we're at and how properties of some of these loads have gotten so much closer to lead that it's um, kind of interesting how it's almost come full circle a little bit on the performance level where it's one of the, it's one of the few cases in what we're talking about where it was like the performance was the highest in the old school, right? Like, mm-hmm. you know, so now and then you had to kind of start over and rebuild back to a higher level of performance, uh, you know, with today. So it's an interesting because most of the time we assume that the older way of doing things was, was, was worse. Like it was harder, heavier, more cumbersome, less comfortable where with ammo, I think everybody, if we had the opportunity, we'd take lead tomorrow, you know, why wouldn't you? But now we have options that are very similar to lead and, and property wise and gives you the same performance. So mm-hmm. it's, it's makes it much, much more palatable and, uh, you know, enjoyable to hunt as well. So I think, I think the ammo is an interesting case. How about guns? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think it's, um, an interesting question and I don't know the, I don't know the, I don't know enough nuance about it to, to speak with, with great authority. Um, Do you want to know what I think is cool about it is that this is another wave because I think a lot of people used to go out with 28 gauges, 20 gauges, and then everything got bigger and better. 10 gauges, you know, 12 gauges, 10 gauge mags, whatever it may be. And now you see so many people going back to the over and under and, you know, 20 gauges, 28 gauges. I think that's, uh, another little cycle that we're going through that I think is really cool. And again, the ammo is, is following it. So, yeah, I, I think that that's, I think that stuff does happen, but I think that's more of a niche, right? I yeah. mean, because I just don't think the average duck hunter has the disposable income to buy like a special 28 gauge to just, you know, uh, do, or, you know, I think that the, the most common case is, you know, a guy duck hunts, he probably takes the same shotgun to the duck blind that he'll take to the turkey woods in the spring. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that kind of thing. And I think 
the versatility of of guns to be able to perform in in combination with choke patterns and um, different am- ammo combinations. You know, the versatility of the gun has allowed them to do that, where they're going to shoot lead and steel effectively through both. Um, I think if you know, I think the people that do the 28 gauge or the over and under are probably more, um, you know, hunters that have, uh, that, that are more enjoyed sort of the romance of it. Right. And sort of the, um, the nostalgia of doing some of those things, or Mm -hmm. perhaps they're, you know, talented trap shooters and they just enjoy the form factor and the feel of a, of an over and under or something like that. But, um, you know, I think that, you know, guns have become, um, increasingly reliable and being able to cycle uh, a variety of, of loads and, you know, work well on three inch and two and three quarter type scenarios. So I, I don't, I don't have a ton. I mean, my experience with guns when I was younger was, was pump action, you know, pump guns. So like I didn't have the cycling concerns and all of these things. So, you know, I don't know what to make of all of that, but I know that, you know, when you're talking improvements in forcing cones and, and things of that nature, I got to imagine that, that those are, uh, you know, effective things that have been introduced to guns out of just desire for greater performance, not necessarily like a need per se. See, you used to be a, a black powder guy, right? Would you ever consider taking a, a muzzle loader out in the marsh? Never. No? No, I would not. Well, why not? Um, I just don't have any desire. I mean, I I want to take it to the plug. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> just uh, my so my black powder days are are old school Pennsylvania flintlock, right? Right. So yeah. I mean, I've I've missed shooting deer more times than I can count because my muzzle loader didn't go off. Um, I don't it's hard enough to get ducks in front of you decoying. I don't need the gun not going off <laughs> to, to, to on the, in that scenario, but also um, you know, black powder is a lot of maintenance. You know, the gun has to be cleaned a lot. It's really susceptible to rust and corrosion and things like that. And just keeping your powder dry is probably inherently challenging in the marsh. <laughs> so yeah, I don't, I don't think I'm a muzzleloader guy for the waterfowl scenario. I think that was a, I think rock house did a, a film on that too. Followed a guy out that shot a couple birds. Yeah, that. I know someone did. I, I, I don't, I don't, I remember seeing that and yeah, I just, I haven't killed enough ducks in my life where I'm willing to just let them fly away because, <laughs> you know, because of muzzle loader issues. <laughs> so. <laughs> Cause you're trying it out. Yeah. Man, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool to think back what, you know, older guys went through and, and what we have now and, well, think about you know, think about the evolution of motion, right? Like, you know, what 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 was probably, um, you know, and I, you know, was spinning wing decoys and surface, uh, you know, things that create ripple and just all of the the pulsators and all that stuff, right? That, that we have now, um, all of that is just in the pursuit of a better mousetrap, right? You know, mm-hmm. a, a jerk string has probably been around for as long as duck hunting's been around, and it creates motion and it does the job, and it's still effective. Most people, in fact, you'll see them talk about how if they were only taking one thing, it'd be a jerk string or you know whatever. But yet, we still have the pursuit of more elaborate, more birds on one chain, more this, more that. Um, you know, in the pursuit of just trying to create a better mousetrap. So. Again, not probably out of out of need, but more out of just desire for a stronger performance. Yep, I like it. I like it. I like it. So, how about how about the then versus now reasons why we hunt? Um, I don't know. I think it was out of necessity before, somewhat. Maybe. Depending how far back you go. Yeah, I mean, maybe. Um, yeah, I, I that I mean I, I've never, so I can't really speak to it. I mean, I've never been in a situation where, like me or my family hunted because that was the food that we were only food we were going to have to put on the table, right? So it was never truly out of a necessity for me to hunt. I'm sure there are folks like that. 
um, or or and maybe there are folks like that more by choice, right? They just that's what they want to put on their table versus mm-hmm. other things. But mm-hmm. um, whatever the choice is, um, you know, if I had to live off of only the ducks that I killed, I would be a very hungry dude. <laughs> I just, you know, um, I think sounds like a new weight loss plan for me. Yeah. I I mean, you, you know, <laughs> I mean, back in, back in the days of market hunting and, you know, not worried about limits and things like that, you know, it's, it's, it was different, but I mean, if you're going to live off of a two mallard limit, you're going to be a hungry dude. <laughs> yep. Yeah. But, yeah, I just think that um, everybody's a little different in that, but I think ultimately the reasons why you hunt are generally the same. I mean, among you know, there's there's a commonality amongst it. I mean, there are easier ways to find food if you hate duck hunting <laughs> than to go out and try to shoot ducks. You know, mm-hmm. I, I'd say you probably should shoot rabbits or deer or something like that. Um, yeah, I think that there's just something special about duck hunting that we all we all share in common that gets us out there one way or the other Why, whether it's because your primary food source, you just, you know, whatever your reasons, they don't have to be justified to anybody. In my opinion, it's just, you know, if you love it, you do it. Yes, sir. I think the bigger, the bigger thing, the last thing I'd probably bring up as far as an evolution of equipment and stuff, um, is, uh, boats and things of that nature, boats, engines, that motors, just just the abil- the ability to get to harder to reach places or um, places that are not easy to reach uh, for the common person have become more easily reachable for the common person. Like you know, um, you're seeing more people use kayaks that are built for you know. Originally, it's like oh hey, you could build you you know you could have a sneak boat. But if you had a kayak or a small boat that you use for fishing, now you can use that for uh, hunting. And now there's more of those small boats that are built and designed specifically for hunting, things of that nature. They're becoming lighter weight and they're becoming um, more versatile. You know, a lot lot of things have changed in in the name of trying to get people to hard to reach places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the surface drives. And I don't know, I really don't know when they started because they aren't a huge deal around here but you know when you're talking about arkansas timber or louisiana the swamps down there and getting through some of that vegetation like even you know lily pads up here in a canoe or kayak is not fun to go through when they're you know lively and green and and all that so getting through a louisiana swamp could be really tough but now with those the surface drives man and they get to spots where they never imagined they could before. Right. And they get there fast. So getting into a duck hole in the morning, just make, like you said, another toll in the toolbox and getting out there and, and getting there quick, getting there safe. And yeah, this is, this is a a huge advantage. This is one where I see uh, development and evolution based on need for sure. Because, you know, it's the need to hunt in shallower water or it's the need to be able to navigate uh, tidal areas safely where you know you can get into skinny water and out of skinny water uh, you need boats that are appropriately designed with large enough engines to support multiple hunters gears dog things of that nature in those environments so you know those are specialty built things and maybe there was you know i don't know maybe those types of engines existed in similar form or fashion you know, for other types of things of trapping or like whatever. I mean, I know you see these, uh, these long tail motors and stuff are born from like a foreign, uh, origin or, you know, origin or whatever. Um, you know, but they've all kind of evolved, uh, to different form forms and things. But some of these ones you see in the back of duck boats now are big, powerful deals that are designed to just like plow in, in uh, skinny water and kind of perform in those environments. And I believe that, that, that's sort of born directly out of need, uh, to to be able to hunt these areas, vice, we could do it before, um, but it's just easier to do it now. Like you know, yeah. if you were on a sneak boat that you were pushing with a push pole, and the water flushed out of your area, like you're not really going anywhere. <laughs> you know what I mean? You probably yeah. Or even taking think about taking a kayak or canoe over some of those down logs that those boats just fly over now. Right. It's like not even a blip on the radar, and you literally would have to, you know, try and hump the boat over the over the down log 
like we do in some of our areas. Yeah. It's just not fun. Well, and I think too, probably some of it is, um, Hey, you know, I'm hunting these spots and there's people only going so far from the ramp because that's all that, you know, they can stand to paddle or push pull. But what if I put this on the back of my boat that could push me further and mm-hmm. could get to get me away from people? You know, I mean, those are also probably driving factors as to what sort of got us now. Now everyone's got these things and it's sort of moot. But like at the time when those were emerging, I guarantee the people that had those first experienced greater success because they were going places where other guys couldn't get, mm-hmm. which is, you know, probably why they've caught on and have been successful. So what else, man? Anything else you think that? offhand can kind of kind of comes to mind as far as no i think the evolution of uh e-mapping right yeah. Fi- finding those spots to get to yeah it all it all plays a part yeah for sure but that was that was i guess then a then versus now would be a paper map versus a, a map on your phone and gps and everything else but yeah i mean i think that everything we you know our lives revolve on cell phones so much now where back then it was like a map and a compass reading and you went (laughs) you know so let me ask you this we're doing a then verse now what is is there anything off the top of your head that you could think of in the future that would be helpful well if i did i wouldn't say it on this podcast because we'd have (laughs) we'd have a design idea that we'd be patenting (laughs) (laughs) but but to your point um, I don't know what that is offhand, but I have no doubt that there will be that thing coming. I mean, that's that's sort of the beauty of that innovation piece that we've talked about in the competition amongst companies to find the next thing. I mean, these companies are they survive off selling equipment and gear and convincing us that they've made a better ba- better mousetrap, and that's mm-hmm. sort of their challenge to tackle. And companies put a lot of research and development and R and D, and you know. The whole idea of like the the whole pro staff thing has sort of been uh, changed over time. There's a good then and now, but you know they they consult with people that spend a lot of time in the field, and you know can provide feedback on what would make life easier or what problems they're having. You know, so there's no doubt in my mind that there will be something coming down the pipe that will make our lives easier, and the challenge is just figuring out what that is and being the first to get there. Hmm. So. I'll be laying in bed all night thinking about it now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, think of something good that we can patent. We there you go. <laughs> Jeez. All right. I, mean, I like what it. That's a good I think that's good. I think that's a good chat. That okay. covers a lot of the majority of stuff that we use. All right. Well, before we before we close it out, you got one last thing that you need to throw at me? Dude, a few weeks away from Canada or Canada trip. Um a lot of people being successful in Canada, a lot of success in the teal fields and water holes. And I don't know, man, it's just, it's back. Season is back. And I wish our, our area was a little bit better. So I'm jealous of seeing all that. But besides that, getting ready to go, man. Yeah, definitely gearing up for that. So we'll be definitely doing some stuff while we're up there and, all that good stuff coming here, coming, coming down the pipe. So that'll be fun. But anyway, let's go ahead and wrap up this week. Before we do, I want to take a minute to thank Quack Rack, Gunner Kennels, Base Map, 737 Duck and Goose Calls, and Duck Camp, as well as Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy, the world's most comprehensive online gun dog training resource. They've got over 160 videos, includes everything you need to take your seven week old puppy to a finished gun dog. Visit cornerstonegundogacademy.com, Cornerstone sign up for the free preview module, and begin your training journey today. Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy, the most advanced gun dog training resource on the web. All right, that does it for episode 153. Hopefully you enjoyed our chat about the evolution of waterfowl gear and sort of our take on sort of where things have been and where we're at now and maybe where we're headed. If you're new to the show, head over to iTunes, check out all of our past episodes. You can leave us a five-star rating and review while you're there. It'll help like mine hunters just like you find our show. That's going to do it for this week. Until next week, for Dan, I'm Josh. Take care. <laughs>